Hi, I'm Camilla. And I'm Miles. In this video, we'll be talking about the People's War in Peru, started by the Communist Party Sendero Luminoso in 1980. We hope to provide you with some extra and hopefully interesting details and examples about this era of revolution. From 1980 to 1992, Sendero rebels, Peruvian state forces, and Andean peasants waged a bitter civil war that left some 69,000 people dead. Before we get into the details of the war, let's begin with some context of Ayacucho's 20th century history. To begin, the region of Ayacucho has always struggled with the issues of political authority and disenfranchisement ever since the days of Spanish colonialism in the 16th century. The region had been inhabited by various indigenous cultures for thousands of years, and today the people in this province are mostly indigenous citizens of Quechua descent. From 1968 to 1975, General Juan Velasco served as president of the revolutionary government of the armed forces. During this time, Velasco's rule was driven by a desire to give justice to the poor and reverse the long-standing governmental practice of abandonment that the indigenous people of the area knew all too well. He introduced a series of progressive policies, such as an agrarian reform project, which intended to give greater autonomy to the people. Although Velasco's dictatorship initially saw a great deal of support from the peasants, it was not long before various economic and political pressures forced him to step down before policies were able to take full effect. One of the most pressing issues left unresolved was one of political authority in the districts. It seemed that with Velasco's reforms, power was finally going to shift out of the hands of Ayacucho's notoriously abusive local leaders and into the hands of the more impoverished, more indigenous majority. However, this presented a threat to the notable, educated citizens who had always held most of the power in the region. When the military regime ended and there was a return to democratic rule, the peasant community were no better off than before. The failed promise of a political shift left many frustrated by the lack of any real changes, which eventually gave rise to the Communist Party of Peru led by Abimal Guzman, also known as Sendero Luminoso. At the same time, the new democratically elected government imposed severe austerity measures to mitigate Peru's failing economy and rapidly inflating currency. The economic crisis served as another reason for senderistas to take up arms against their capitalist-oriented government. In examining the complex relations between Guzman, the peasants, and the state, we can see the various shifts in this triangle of power and how each group played a distinct role in the outcome of the revolution. Sendero Luminoso was born in the highlands of Peru at the National University of San Cristobal de Umanga in Ayacucho. From the outset, the organization was led by Abimal Guzman, who taught philosophy at the university. As a professor, he would earn the nickname Dr. Shampoo for his ability to brainwash listeners with his lectures. He was an incredibly charismatic speaker, which allowed him to garner a lot of attention among the students. Over the years, Guzman was able to recruit a strong base of support by moving beyond the university and expanding the party's relationships with peasant communities in other districts of Ayacucho. Guzman's revolutionary thinking was largely influenced by Maoist traditions of philosophy and politics. He aimed for a complete overthrow of the system, which meant a collapse of the state, dismantling of capitalism, and replacement of, of the bourgeois democracy with a new democracy ruled by the proletariat. The movement was able to spread quickly in the countryside and gain massive support from the peasants partly because they were fed up with their long history of being marginalized and abandoned by the government. Most of them harbored deep resentment for authority as well, having a long history of abusive, often disrespectful relations with the police. Years of being plagued by various social, political, and economic problems culminated in this radical desperation for change. The elected civilian government, which came into the office July 1980, continued to neglect Ayacucho. It re still remained a low-priority area for resources from the center. In part, this was due to the severe economic crisis at the time, but also in part to the administration's failure to take Sendero seriously between 1980 and 1982. 
In retrospect, the government's approach was a big mistake, considering Sanero's leadership committed itself publicly to the armed struggle in 1979. It soon moved to more violent stages in March 1982, with the massive attack on the Ayacucho jail and release of all prisoners, including over 50 suspected senderistas. Levels of violence steadily escalated during this period, and it was only until the very end of 1982 that the central government declared a state of emergency. Government policy of abandonment during the late 1960s and early 1970s played right into the hands of Sendero. The ineffectiveness of rural initiatives and other programs led to more and more resentment towards the state. It's no surprise then that the points of greatest contact between the peasantry and Sendero tended to be those of least contact between the peasantry and government. Sendero became one continuing and positive hope for many peasants. Its ideology and commitment provided quite literally a shining path toward a better future. However, as violence in the region intensified and the revolution took a different path than expected, this initial support was eventually lost. Despite the advantages Sendero once had and the state's mistakes in the early 1980s, the People's War was not won. Let's start analyzing the reasons from the relationship between the senderistas and the peasants. While Guzman's Marxist ideology should have united the peasants in the revolution, his blatant disregard for the local customs, values, and roots of indigenous culture alienated the party from its presumed beneficiaries. For example, in the second half of 1992, the senderistas cut off the supply of rural produce and laborers to the urban centers of Ayagucho, isolated the liberated red zones, and even tried to close down the weekly local markets. They desired economic self-sufficiency, but they could not achieve it. They disregarded the peasants' pragmatic interests and jeopardized their livelihood by imposing difficulties to commodity exchange, labor migration, and participation in cash economy. Another thing that antagonized the peasants was their repudiation of peasant leaders. Contrary to creating a government of the peasants, they replaced the local peasant authorities with their cadres, murdering many peasant leaders in the process. The deaths of these beloved leaders enraged their relatives and community members. Gradually, senderistas came to be known as monsters by the highlanders and their indiscriminate killings drove the peasants to also violent resistance. It's well known that on January 21, 1993, peasants in Huaychao killed seven guerrillas that entered the village, revenging the execution of their leaders. Some peasants also organized self-defense forces known as Rondas Campesinas, and when Fujimori became president, he provided the Rondas with arms and training. As a result, the number and membership of the Rondas mushroomed and became the first line of defense against the Sendero. In effect, the Rondas were capable of fending off guerrilla attacks long enough to enable army units to arrive on the scene and rout the invaders. This is just one of the actions the states took after the top-to-bottom review by the military of its counterinsurgency strategy in 1988 and 1989. To win popular support, the military began a heart and mind civic action campaign, which included free haircuts and health clinics, whitewashing and re-roofing local schools, trash cleanup campaigns, soup kitchens, and building access roads or trails. The governments also did a good job in collecting intelligence. Soldiers from the community or area participated in operations in that locality. They knew the community, spoke the local language or dialect, and often could help the military unit communicate with locals and gather more accurate intelligence on enemy plans. The textbook mentions the role of National Intelligence Service, but doesn't mention another very important intelligence unit, the Special Intelligence Group, under the National Directorate Against Terrorism. GAIN was preserved by Fujimori from the previous administration, and had the sole mission of tracking the Sendero leadership. It was GAIN that located Guzman in a safe house in Surco and captured him on September 12, 1992. Fujimori took two more important initiatives. 
After the Aldo Golpe in 1992, he established a court procedure of faceless judges. In trials of captured guerrillas, the judges concealed their identity so as to protect them from the sendero's reprisals. Also, they short-circuited due process to ensure rapid verdict. In 1993, the government implemented a repentance law that enabled senderistas to turn themselves in with their weapons or information in exchange for support, retraining, and progressive reintegration into society. In the textbook, Dawson portrayed Fujimori's economic policies negatively, but in effect, those draconian measures did pull Peru out of the crisis. Inflation dropped, employment increased, and by 1994. Peru had the highest economic growth rate in Latin America. Especially, the government created small agencies to focus on development programs in areas of extreme poverty. The programs are like irrigation, potable water, reforestation and soil conservation, electrification, etc. These actions helped the government to gain some approval in the early years of Fujimori's presidency. In the Sendero, the power is over-concentrated in a single individual, the President Gonzalo. Therefore, ever since his capture, the organization became very vulnerable. By the end of 1994, Sendero Luminoso had ceased to pose a threat to the Peruvian state. Finally, just to touch a little bit on the post-revolution period, Fujimori was not really a bless to the country. His regime was extremely authoritarian. He manipulated people's fear that had been ingrained during revolution. He classified any opposition as criminal and a threat to return to the chaotic past. With the military at his back, he could blatantly use violence to oppress the opponents and intimidate the people. He also had the legislation and the media working in his favor. Peruvians had a lot to suffer before Fujimori fled the country in 2000 in his third term of presidency obtained by fraudulent election. Thank you for watching our video. We hope you like it. Bye bye.